Well, hello, everybody. I'm Lisa Harker. I'm director of the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory, and I'd like to welcome you to this lunchtime talk. We're joined today by Professor Peter Fonagy, who's chief executive of the Anna Freud Centre and professor of psychoanalysis and developmental science at UCL, University College London. Peter is one of the UK's leading clinical psychologists and psychoanalysts, and his work has shaped contemporary practice among professionals working with children and families. So we're really delighted that he has joined us today. In this conversation, I'm gonna be talking to Peter about mentalization. He's gonna explain more about the concept and how understanding mentalization and providing mentalizing environments can help professionals to work more effectively with children, young people, and their parents. We'll also discuss how important it is for children and young people to feel um, and have belief in the professionals who give them information and advice and take decisions about their lives. But before we begin, I'm just gonna say a few words about the format of the event today. So many of you have signed up for the event. There are several hundred of you who've signed up. Um, and so we'll, we can't see you during the event, but we do want to hear from you. We've already received lots of questions in advance. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. But please, during the course event, please put comments and questions in the chat tab. We're going to try and address as many questions as we can in the time we have. But all of the comments and the questions will be read by the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory team, and this helps us to shape future events and research. A recording of today's conversation will be available. If you'd like to listen to the discussion again, please go to the events section of our website, that's nuffieldfjo.org.uk, uh, where you'll be able to see a recording, and in fact, previous lunchtime talks are also available there. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Peter. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a delight to be here. You do such important work. It's so wonderful to be part of it, Lisa. I really am honored and really pleased to be here. It's wonderful to have you. So I'm gonna start with a really basic question. Help me to understand this. What exactly is mentalization? Well, mentalizing, we prefer the word mentalizing because it um, identifies something that's active. It's really just understanding or seeing others' behavior being driven by mental states, which are just thoughts, feelings, beliefs, wishes, desires that make actions comprehensible, that you see something being done and you assume that there was some thought uh, or feeling uh, behind it. Um, and it's unique human capacity that really underpins social collaboration. Um, it makes actions meaningful, but it also makes experience controllable and uh, comprehensible. Um, so if I was going to just have a one sentence definition of it, I would say it's an awareness of the awareness of other people and of course, also an awareness of self-experience. So think, yeah. is it something new? Is it a new concept or is it a very old concept that we've just only become more recently aware of? Uh, well, you know, it would have been very difficult for people to avoid it. Uh, originally, probably the first person to draw attention to it was uh, a guy, a philosopher in Vienna called Brentano. Uh, but uh, it then has kind of, Janet, philosopher of mind, uh, uh, reinvigorated research in that area, calling it theory of mind. But people have been interested in empathy uh, since time immemorial. Uh, so uh, what um, I think uh, a, a very important uh, anthropologist, psychologist drew attention to uh, Michael Tomasello um, is that uh, it probably some kind of a stepwise development at some point in human evolution, when we suddenly, uh, it paid to collaborate with others. To collaborate with others, uh, you got to uh, actually understand what they are thinking or feeling uh, to establish uh, some kind of uh, uh, joint action. 
Um, and, and that kind of collaboration is uh, it's based on uh, shared planning and uh, that sort of thing. It's, it's just human. Um, you know, other, other primates, half a bride, they can't do it quite as well as we can. Um, and you, you mentioned empathy in, in your explanation there, but is it, is it the same as empathy or is it different from empathy? Well, I, empathy is usually a term that's refer, that refers to um, uh, a feeling that one shares with someone else. Uh, but uh, it's more effective than it's cognitive. But uh, a concept like theory of mind is uh, much more cognitive than it is uh, effective. Mentalizing covers both. But mentalizing is not just about understanding others. It's not just about me trying to understand you, Lisa, as you are trying to do this interview and me trying to guess, well, what is she, you know, what is she getting at? What she, she's trying to help people here understand. I wasn't really clear about what empathy and uh, mentalizing differed. So that's what I should now clarify. Uh, uh, it's also about me. So it's also me trying to understand myself. Uh, so being able to attribute, uh, for example, my currently uh, pulse rate racing at above 80 uh, to uh, feeling anxious about talking to you and talking to all the people. So mentalizing is both self and other, uh, uh, and is both cognitive and effective. Okay. Empathy is just one part. Just one part of it. So in the context of children's development, um, at what stage does a child begin to understand their own mind? Um, and if I could add another question in at the same time, if, if, that's, if that development is damaged in some way, how might that affect them in their later life? That's a, a brilliant question. Uh, and one I'm kind of really delighted to answer because we now understand a lot more uh, about how mentalizing develops from something like shared uh, emotions, which babies can do with each other. One baby cries, the other baby will cry. Uh, so that's kind of there, but it's not really until about a year and a half, uh, two years, that people acquire, um, a child acquires the idea that someone else, um, maybe someone else's uh, mind may be uh, uh, different from their own and, and that their actions can be better understood um, by uh, uh, understanding uh, that to follow their gaze to what it is that they are looking at, to know what they are thinking, to uh, detect um, what the intention is behind uh, an action. That's, uh, and then, you know, much later, um, uh, trying to uh, understand uh, knowledge, uh, in, inferring what somebody else must know uh, in, for them to be uh, uh, doing a particular action. So uh, theory of mind as it was originally uh, developed uh, was a, a kind of test uh, that looked at if you, if a, a, a puppet changes, um, uh, what knowledge it's exposed to, um, uh, if, you know, puppy uh, puts a, a, an object into place A, you know, in a cupboard, uh, goes away, um, uh, the child then observes uh, the, pup, the, the, the thing being moved uh, to a, another location, puppet comes back, the child is asked, where will that puppet look for? Uh, the object, a child less than three is likely to say uh, what they know, which is in a new place. Uh, a child who is uh, 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 older than three, you say, well, so well, they look in the old place. Uh, it turns out it's not as simple as that. It turns out that it's actually much more continuous. And a lot of the reason that there is that jump is much more to do with the experiment and the way it's spread. But Gradually, I would say from the first year of life, the end of the first year of life, the child looks very carefully at adults, really carefully, to see what it is that they know. 
what it is that might be driving uh, uh, their actions. Um, later, they can, uh, that gets linked with self-awareness. Uh, and you know, between three and nine, they can ascribe mental states. They can communicate about mental states. They can explain it. But much, much more earlier, uh, much earlier, there is uh, already uh, is an awareness uh, that other people have mind. So we had a question um, in advance from a social worker who says, I'm working with a teenager who's had experienced trauma in their early lives. The teenager's having difficulty making and maintaining relationships and refusing to engage in therapeutic work. Now, is this a, a, the sort of presentation that you might expect, obviously, from a child who's experienced trauma, but it, is this also a child who's having difficulty mentalizing? And what would you, you know, how would you go about supporting them in that way? Um, well, the supporting them in that way part of your question is really quite difficult and complicated, and I will try and answer it, but I'm not sure that I'll answer it well without context. But uh, certainly, um, trauma uh, is a uh, has multiple impacts uh, and interferes with mentalizing at a range of levels. Um, so, just to be very simple. Uh, and simplistic about it, and it's really not rocket science. I had a, 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 a child not uh, um, uh, in treatment, young, in fact, a, a young person uh, uh, who um, uh, had difficulty, social uh, problems, in fact, was sometimes quite violent, you know, grabbed handbags from ladies, who, and, and, you know, uh, behaved without consideration of others. Um, then you um, uh, asked him about what happened to him as a child. He was child of an alcoholic father who actually urinated on him and his sister when he came home drunk. When you think about his, as a child, being age four or five, why would you be interested in the mental states of adults when you experience that yourself? You want to withdraw from mental states because they're far too painful. You want to avoid it. And I would suspect that in, the, in that question um, uh, about that young person, there must be, with the history of trauma, that person obviously had experiences where human beings, adults, didn't behave as they should have done. Uh, they were driven by thoughts and feelings that were frankly hostile to that young person. Uh, why would I want to think about uh, how people think or feel uh, if that's the kind of thing that I find? People being frankly hostile towards me. So um, trauma interferes in, in just in that way of avoidance, but also of course um, trauma brings with it um, a, a failure of trust uh, of others. So, you avoid others, you withdraw from them. And the way we learn about mind is through close relationships, through attachment relationships, by exploring, you know, freely exploring, playing with the thoughts and feelings that our caregivers have. The more we play with them, the more we understand about mind. The more serious life is, and the more we can't afford to pretend to play, the more difficult it is to learn about mind. So it's uh, a complicated relationship, but we now know there's a lot of evidence that trauma undermines mental health and makes individuals who experience trauma reluctant to think about uh, mental states in themselves and in others. If you don't think about mental states in, them, in yourself, you become emotionally dysregulated, um, you have uh, problems of trusting others. Uh, you have um, uh, also um, probably uh, disordered relationships uh, with others because you don't understand uh, why others do things. So it has a whole set of problems that unfortunately drives other problems, like in a network, because... Uh, if, if you withdraw from others, 
You won't learn from them. If you don't learn from them, you don't learn uh, uh, about yourself from others as we normally do. And I, I'm, I know the answer to the question, how do you respond to that as a professional is a huge one. It's your life's work. But I suppose, are there any sort of fundamental um, considerations that any professional working with children need to have in mind? Is this about trying to um, really understand the, the limits that a young person might have in terms of understanding their own mental state? and why that might present in certain behaviours and not reinforcing, inadvertently reinforcing that pattern by withdrawing from them. Yeah, I mean, the, the tragedy of these young people um, is that they're behaving in ways that make us pull away from them, avoid them, in some way physically, psychologically engaging with their thoughts or feelings, which deprives them of the only route by which they could acquire that capacity. Uh, so we focus on that behavior and we want to change that behavior uh, because that's easier than uh, trying to see where they're coming from. But actually the only way that we have found of um, changing their, um, uh, the way they act is by enabling them to mentalize. Uh, through our relationship with them, that's a mentalizing relationship, through creating environments for them uh, that focus on them as thinking, feeling uh, individuals that have, uh, that emphasize their agency rather than undermining their agency, as we often have systems uh, that actually deny them agency, which actually then undermines their capacity to mentalize. So our, our systems often work against uh, a natural process of cure. Um, what I want to emphasize is that there is no secret ingredient here, that what we actually have learned uh, over the years is that treatments that focus on mentalizing, that actually try to understand where the person is coming from, that validates their perspective and celebrates when they are engaging in thinking about themselves or about us, reinforces that rather than uh, other aspects uh, of their baby, actually is enormously effective uh, because there is a natural tendency to want to mentalize. That is, is our you know, heritage as human beings. If uh, our environment stops us from doing that, it blocks that, then we won't do it. Um, uh, and what we need to do is to create interpersonal relationships um, uh, that, that encourage it. So I came across a wonderful example of a judge um, uh, who, uh, um, uh, wrote, uh, it was uh, uh, settling a, a, a very complex case involving um, siblings. Uh, and they came, the judge came to certain decisions, then wrote a wonderful letter to each of those siblings, explaining to them why they came to that decision. Disclosing his mind, his way of thinking to the young people, in order for that to encourage them to get into a frame of understanding others through their thoughts and feelings. So uh, within um, uh, the kind of justice system that, that, that you are serving, um, I think there's so much opportunity uh, to enhance mentalizing that I, I really hope that if I make a, a if I increase it just one fraction of 1% uh, in some of the people who are listening, I would be delighted. That's a great example of a, a small step that might have a very big impact on, on those two young people. In the family court, um, it's, not, it's obviously the focus is on decisions on the child, but often in front of the, the judge is the, the parent or the parents. And their own history may be one of, of trauma. 
Um, and we particularly hear about how often their behaviours might suggest that they're struggling to understand themselves and understand um, their partner or their circumstances. So again, is, is, is mentalizing uh, an approach that whether you're a, a, a social worker, a judge, a solicitor, you know, can you be using these, this, these techniques to be thinking about how to support parents in these circumstances? Yes, um, definitely. So uh, one, the, the step number one, uh, Lisa, is to stop non-mentalizing. Uh, so when um, a, uh, a parent uh, is too certain of what someone else is thinking or feeling, lacks curiosity, um, uh, or is focusing on behavior, uh, on outcome, or tells you lengthy stories about things that may or may not be true, but it's far too complicated, then you know that they're not mentalizing. Um, and if they are that point, ask to just, you know, think about how they feel about something when they were holding forth about how somebody else feels. Or uh, they were uh, uh, talking about how everybody, uh, you know, what everybody thought, but ignoring how everybody felt. Um, uh, these very simple uh, manipulations, just to broaden the way that people think about mental states is enormously helpful. So, you know, I find that the most helpful thing is creating curiosity. Uh, and, uh, you know, parents in, in those situations want to do the best for their children but they are too certain about what the child is doing or why they're doing it. And to create curiosity in them about the child, just to encourage them, perhaps asking them, why did you ask him? You know, why, 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 you know, see what he says when you've asked him, you know, why, you know, what, what was going on in his mind? Not complicated, never complicated questions, never why questions, always what questions. And always assuring that you take the person's perspective seriously. You validate it. Uh, you clarify it. You affirm it, even if you don't agree with it. You don't start opposing it. You want to encourage them to mentalize. And that's what we found was pretty much the main thing that you needed to do is validate clarify, and then maybe once you feel that um, uh, they are a little bit more thinking alongside you, to try and put an alternative perspective. But have you thought that it might be that actually your, you know, your son didn't respond to your text, not because they want to ignore you, but because uh, they run out of uh, battery charge or whatever. Uh, uh, but you know, you first of all hear how they experienced the feeling of not being responded to. Yeah, so starting with that validation uh, yeah. and then then helping them see. I want to try and rattle through some of the questions we've had, including the ones on the chat. Um, there were a couple of questions in advance sent to us about, I mean, this is clearly a kind of human universal concept. Um, but there were some questions about individual differences. So um, is a mentalizing approach um, a, a appropriate, suitable for a neurodivergent population, for example? How does it uh, interpret it in different cultures? Could you say a bit about that? Yeah, um, neurodivergence is a really interesting question. People used to believe that the um, fundamental deficit of an individual with a diagnosis of autism was that they couldn't mentalize. Um, it now turns out uh, that it's a much part of a much broader problem. Um, um, uh, could it? Uh, could that uh, be helpful? Could this help average be helpful? I don't have the empirical evidence to suggest that it is, but I deeply believe that it is. 
um, but it has to be just like anything else titrated to the capacity of the individual uh, to process the information. Um, to recognize an individual's difficulty in mentalizing, whether they are neurodivergent or not, is a core part of the approach, uh, taking that on board. Different cultures do mentalize different. Um, that, uh, so for example, more collective cultures focus more on what other people think or believe. Our Western, kind of weird, Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic cultures, our weird cultures focus much more on what you think yourself and you feel yourself. Um, because we bring up children uh, with parenting being focused on the parent, the mother usually, reading the child's mind uh, and telling the child what they feel. Uh, in a non-Western culture, the child is brought up looking at the environment, looking at people outside, and as an apprentice to learn about other people. So they learn more about others, but it's the same process. Okay, that's so interesting. Um, there was also a question, uh, obviously um, there are some treatments that have mentalization as its of course concept. Is there a, a question from a barrister actually, is there a national program to ensure that there are, there are principles that are being consistently and appropriately applied? We have um, uh, mentalization based training. Um, uh, that for both uh, adults and, 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 and children and now foster parents uh, as well that's being uh, tested, um, that is being very rigorously um, manualized, uh, tested in randomized controlled trials, and then trained according to the results of that, those trials with supervisors who are also accredited with that kind of uh, uh, hierarchy at the peak of which is the person who is doing the training. Um, is that adhered to rigorously throughout the system? I dare say that it's not because none of no such systems are. Uh, the Anna Freud Center uh, um, that I'm chief executive of actually has uh, a, a list of registered practitioners um, uh, and we uh, uh, who we, you know, who have uh, uh, been supervised. Uh, to be honest, do I believe that uh, they are the only people that can deliver this? The answer is no. <laughs> I, I think that mentalizing is something that we do as human beings. It's one of the most fundamental, as I started saying, capacities that all therapists, regardless of orientation, try and implement. Um, and I would say um, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, there, are, there are treatments that are focused on this, but most evidence-based treatments have a component that actually improves mentalizing and as a consequence, improves the capacity of the individual to trust other human beings because they understand them better. I think that is a brilliant note on which to end the sort of message that this is for all of us. This is not this is not something that we can have to access as a sort of professional therapy on its own. This is something we can all take part in. It matters to us all. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Peter Follahy. That's been such an interesting conversation. We could have gone on. I can see the questions are still flooding in, um, but I hope people have found it really useful. And I certainly found it so interesting. Thank you very much for attending. If you want to find out more about the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory, you can see um, our website, nuffieldfgo.org.uk um, and find out more about our work, but you can also sign up to regular bulletins which contain information about our research and our upcoming events. We would be really grateful if you would um, complete the feedback form. It just takes a couple of minutes, but this really helps us think about how to um, respond to your needs and make sure these events are worthwhile for you. But finally, once again, Peter, thank you so much. It's been such an interesting conversation. I loved it very much, Lisa. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Pleasure.